Good afternoon, everyone. You know, we have a lot to talk about today. And uh, the most important of which is the future of our city and how that if we're a city of imagination and come together, we can work on some of the toughest challenges that we have, challenges like transportation and housing and how we protect our environment. But you know, first I want to talk about kindness and wonder. You know, kindness is something that we seem to talk about more, but experience less. You know, and wonder, the joy from true discovery is even more elusive. But again, if we come together, we can have a city of kindness, a city of wonder. Now, let, let me tell you what, I'm, what I mean by that. Uh, you know, the first time I remember somebody showing me an act of kindness outside my immediate family was when I was four years old. You know, over here we have a picture of me when I was four years old. I'm not the cute one on the left, that's my cousin. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the chubbier guy. Uh, you know, and I come from a pretty big family, five of us, uh, the third of five. Uh, all you middle children out there, you know who you are. Uh, here's to you guys. Uh, but you know, uh, like, like most families, you, you need strategies to keep, your, keep folks together and so you don't get lost. Uh, and one year at the Western Idaho Fair, I was lagging behind my mother, and my mother was carrying a very specific balloon. Uh, I think it's up there. If you look up there, it's that Mickey Mouse balloon. It's a balloon within a balloon. Uh, and she said, you know, Dave, stay with us, but if you get lost, look up, find the Mickey Mouse balloon, and you know where we are. Well, of course, I got behind again. Uh, but I looked up, and I found the balloon, and I went and I grabbed my mother's leg, only to look up, and it was some other mother with the very same Mickey Mouse balloon. Well, my eyes are filling up with tears, and I'm starting to panic. And this woman, a total stranger, she grabbed me by the hand, and she walked me around the fair until we found my family. You know, it's more than 50 years ago, and it's still a vivid uh, in my memory. Isn't that the Boise that we know? You know, let me give you a little more modern example. Uh, one of our libraries, the Collister Library, uh, they developed something they called guerrilla kindness. Uh, I think there's a, a little pic, there'll be a picture here. They put a box out uh, at the reference desk and they invited patrons to write some message of kindness, some message uh, of encouragement uh, anonymously, put it in the box, uh, and we got dozens of them. People responded uh, in incredible numbers so the librarians, they took those messages and they put them in books all around the library. You know, can you imagine the wonder of pulling a book out, open it up, uh, pure serendipity and finding a message of encouragement from a total stranger, from somebody else? Uh, kindness and wonder, folks. That's the Boise we know. That's the Boise we need to encourage. You know, I'm going to return to those themes a little later. Uh, but how about Elin Jewell, ladies and gentlemen? I think she and her family are still here. Oh, my. Uh, we, are, we are so fortunate that, she's, that she calls Boise home. And how about LED? My gosh, the level of performance that we have in this town. You know, we're at the Morrison Center, folks. Holy cow. Uh, you feel like you've arrived when you're at the Morrison Center. You know, James Patrick is the executive director of the Morrison Center. There are uh, cultural ambassadors, uh, one of them, uh, one of our two for these next couple years. It's because of him and all their crew, Boise State and the chamber, that we're able, we outgrew the Egyptian. Uh, now we get to be here at the Morrison Center. Please thank all those folks, but especially all the folks at the Morrison Center. And you know, after uh, I'm through speaking, uh, we have our other cultural ambassador, uh, ambassador Global Lounge. They're going to entertain us, uh, so stay tuned for that. You know, last year in this speech, I said we have to be a city that does big things. And so we are doing big things. You know, I think one of the most important civic efforts in the history of the city of Boise, I know that's a big statement, but it's true, one of the most important efforts is, is becoming a reality 
because of the work of so many people, I'm talking about our new main library. You know, Moshe Safdi is an internationally acclaimed uh, architect. He saw such promise in the project that he signed on. He's come out with uh, his designs. We've had a number of discussions on the, on the philanthropic end because that's an important piece. Those conversations are going uh, very well. You know, it's clear that the community has embraced this project. Uh, and I just couldn't be happier. You know, we have a ways to go, but hundreds of people came out for open houses or made comments how we can make this project better. Uh, we've got to work hard on what should be the future of the cabin because we have to get this right. Uh, this is a hundred year project if we do it right. It's so important that we're a city that values knowledge and that your access to knowledge is as good as we can make it, that it be free, that you can pursue, pursue your dreams and your sense of wonder. That's what libraries are all about. You know, Moshe Safdi is coming uh, this month, September 21st. And uh, I'd love to invite you. It's a public forum. It's at Jump. And I'd love to invite you to come. But we sold out. It was so popular. We filled it up right away. Uh, but we'll make sure and get the word out uh, about what he has to say. He's going to speak about the vision for a library. And we're just so excited to make this happen. You know, I want to talk about the Boise Sports Park. You know, I'm not going to kid you. It's been a windy road on that project. Uh, but, you know, uh, Chris Shane, he's the owner of the Hawks and an owner of a minor league soccer franchise. Uh, he's acquiring uh, property in the West End. We love the site on Americana. But the West End has uh, some real advantages. There's more overall property to be developed. There, uh, it's more amenable to the mix of uses that we want to see on the library. There's better access. It's more prominent. Uh, we're really excited. We're going to bring uh, drawings uh, of the ballpark on that specific site. We're going to bring those out. But what's most exciting to me, the Boise Sports Park is about families. Having an accessible, affordable way to get to a great sporting event or some other event. You know, and the vibrancy we see all over downtown will be coming to the West End as well. I think we can do this project and we need to. You know, uh, another area, we're always looking for economic opportunity to increase the opportunity in the city of Boise across all professions, but maybe uh, especially professional technical careers, careers that pay wages that support a family. That's why we're so excited uh, about our new industrial park. You know, uh, a company called Boyer has already signed on. They made a significant uh, in, uh, investment in Boise already. And uh, it's in the south uh, part of town, got great access to the freeway, to the airport. We need that kind of activity. We need to diversify our economy. Uh, we need the kind of jobs that new, these new businesses will attract uh, to put upward pressure on wages for all our citizens. Uh, we're so excited about the Boise Gateway Industrial Park, so stay tuned for that as well. You know, an iconic library, the Boise Sports Park, a vibrant industrial park, uh, these are the kinds of projects that we've tried to bring all the time I've been here. Uh, you know, but those are just the three uh, most recent examples. Just take a look at what's gone on since 2004. 14 new parks in the city of Boise, a new municipal golf course, four neighborhood libraries where we didn't have any, three rec centers, uh, eight uh, fire stations, either new or renovated, the fire training facility. Allenbaugh House for those with substance abuse, the James Castle House, uh, the Boise Whitewater Park, Rhodes Skate Park. Uh, these are just some of the things that we've been able to do. And you know, it's so important to the civic life of the city of Boise. Let me tell you what I mean. You know, uh, consider a, a family, they buy a house, their kids are young, and they have a, a, a park site next to them. But I've had uh, these kind of families come to me and say, you know, Mayor, our, our children are grown now. We're getting our park, but it's, it's too late for us. You know, that is not going to happen in the city of Boise anymore. We need through three or four more uh, budget cycles, uh, but we're going to be caught up. The backlog sometimes was decades, uh, and we're going uh, to be caught up. You know what that means? You can't really talk about the future if you haven't kept your commitments that you've already made. Uh, it's, such a, uh, it's such a great time. And you know, it's important to recognize the work that went in 
uh, to bring us to this point, and that's where our great city council comes in. I know they've been recognized, but let's recognize them again for the work that they do. They're right up here. Our present city council members, those that came before us, the blocking and tackling that it went in to get us caught up, uh, you know, is such an important time. It represents uh, an inflection point in the evolution of the city, a point that we really ought to get together and plan and talk about the future. Uh, because, you know, ladies and gentlemen, maybe more than past decades, it uh, falls to us to plan. It's an important part, but you know, we are on our own. Uh, let me tell you what I, what I mean by that. You know, there are experts all around the country, uh, most prominent of whom is a, a gentleman named Bruce Katz. And he wrote a book called The New Localism. And he and others point out that, you know, the federal government can't seem to get their act together and aren't living up to, uh, to their commitments uh, state governments in the country are pulling back. It falls to local communities to step into the breach. But you know, Bruce Katz, he sounds uh, a fairly optimistic tone about this, and I agree with him, because he points out that the future belongs to problem solvers. And problems over the course of history are best solved locally. They're more resilient, more efficient, more effective. Uh, that's where we need to go. You know. Uh, we're going to push the uh, federal, state governments uh, to, co to keep their commitments. But, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think the cavalry is coming uh, anytime soon. So then it falls to us. And what do I mean by that? You know, what I mean is we need to be a city of imagination, a city with the creativity to envision the kind of city that we want to be in the future and then go to work to make that happen. Uh, a city where private and public innovation comes together to take on some of the biggest challenges that we have. You know, only a city like that do you get equality of opportunity where everybody has a shot at having success. You know, today I want to talk about three challenges, challenges in three areas, the areas of transportation and housing and uh, how we protect our environment. Let's start with transportation first. You know, uh, about, we are uh, in a really important uh, time right now. We need public transportation. When you think about the city of the future, don't you see public transportation? You know, I see trains, and I know a number of, of you do too. But don't we all see fast, clean, efficient public transportation? Isn't that the city that you imagine going forward? You know, we're going to have bikes and pedestrians and we're likely gonna have autonomous vehicles. You know, but if we stake our future too much on vehicles, we're gonna have a future of gridlock. It doesn't matter whether we're driving those vehicles or they're autonomous, we're gonna see gridlock. You know, right now, 80% of trips, uh, commuter trips, are a single person alone in his or her car. The rest, the other 20%, you know, biking, uh, taking transit, walking, carpooling. Can't we go to work on that, on those numbers? Can't we go to work on that and make uh, real other options besides going by yourself uh, in a car? It's mobility that we need. Isn't that really what we need? And the more modes we have, the better. So public transportation, if we're going to have it, we need uh, a funding source. You've heard me talk about this before. You know, for 40 years, 30 or 40 years, Local governments and business interests have gone to the Idaho legislature and said, not, not give us money, just give us authority to go to our citizens and make the case for a particular use. Uh, nearly every urban area in the country has that authority, but for those 30 or 40 years, the Idaho legislature has said, uh, we're not willing to do that. But you know, I see uh, a pathway anyway, some reason for hope and a pathway that we can solve this issue, and that's through the initiative process. You know, six or eight years ago, the Idaho legislature made it more difficult for uh, initiatives to pass. And they were pretty smug about it and gave an elbow to all of us, the great state of Ada isn't gonna control our futures in initiative. You know, I don't think they, we are a great state of Ada, you know that. Uh, 
But, you know, I don't think they foresaw that uh, not too many years after, they made it so much harder to pass an initiative that two would make the ballot. This year, uh, all the signatures were obtained and verified, and both horse racing and the Medicaid expansion are, are on the ballot. I don't know that you could, too, you could find two more diverse initiatives uh, in the same year. But you know, I've endorsed them both. I think they're both important to the future of our city and our state. But you know, there may be no more important issue on the ballot this November than the Medicaid expansion. You know, there are folks, these are good, hardworking people. That is great. You know, these are folks that, that work hard and play by the rules. They make too much money for one program and not enough for another. That gap needs to be filled. There are thousands of folks like that around the state, but thousands in the city of Boise. We need to help that get across the finish line and pass the Medicaid expansion. And speaking of the finish line, let's let the ponies run too, why don't we? <laughs> well, we don't have a commercial break, folks, so I gotta <laughs> have a little water. You know, but if either of those initiatives pass, if either one passes, you know, uh, we'll have a roadmap. This is how it's done. This is the amount of money you need, the amount of volunteers. This, these are the areas you need to go for the signatures. We need to get up uh, uh, the day after the election in November, if one of them passes and get to work and pass a local option initiative. There are areas all around the state that want to do this. We got to uh, bind together. We will do our part and lead the charge in Boise. It's transit that we need and it's local option we need to do it. Thank you. Another uh, big challenge uh, is the area of housing. You know, let me, let me tell you what we're up against here. You know, in 1975, the city of Boise was around 70, 75,000 people. Uh, and, you know, in 1975, a third, you know, uh, we have three times more people here. But in 1975, the federal government gave us $5 million in community development block grant funding. That's CDBG funding. It's the best uh, funding from the federal government we get. It's the most flexible, most practical. Uh, it's great to really make a difference in affordable housing. Uh, now we're three times bigger. Last year we got $1.2 million uh, under the same program. Uh, you know, even if we just kept up with inflation, let alone for the growth that we see in the city, uh, that would be $23 million that we would have received last year. You know, and unlike uh, other states, uh, Idaho doesn't give uh, municipalities any direct funding for affordable housing. Actually, you know, Idaho does have a housing trust fund, but they've never put any money into it. You know, isn't that a little like my millionaire fund? You know, I'm still a million bucks shy of my goal. Uh, a trust fund with no money. Uh, but that's what's gone on. You know, even with, th with those kind of headwinds, uh, we've been able to do some uh, amazing things. Over the last couple years, the city of Boise has leveraged $5 million into 250 units of affordable housing. You know, and one of the best projects uh, in there is a project called Adair Manor. Uh, it's going up on uh, Fairview and 25th on city-owned property. And the great thing about Adair Manor, it's 160, 170 units, and it's got all kinds of housing, from market housing to workforce housing for the middle-income folks, and it's got more affordable housing for uh, folks that need a little more help. It's all you know, in, in one development in a great spot in downtown Boise. But you know, uh, we need to do more. Uh, that's why we're announcing an initiative called Grow Our Housing. And Grow Our Housing is the framework for how we're going to address uh, the issue of housing and affordable housing in our city. And there are three main principles that are going to guide us in that. You know, first, the housing has to be balanced across, across all income levels. It has to be compact. Uh, we don't want, want sprawl. We don't want to go to uh, sensitive areas. It has to be compact. It makes the most of our public and private investment. Uh, you know, and finally, it has to be possible. Uh, if it isn't realistic, we're going to stretch to do all we can 
but we need to set realist, realistic, achievable goals. Those are the principles uh, that are going to guide us. And I, I need to be very frank. You know, cities in Idaho, we don't have the resources or the authority uh, to take on every social service need that we see in cities. You know, we're not health and welfare. We don't have those kinds of resources. But, you know, I was taught growing up, and I believe that a society is judged by how well we treat our least fortunate citizens. That's what our city needs to stand for. We simply have to dig in and do more. You know, when we imagine the city of the future, don't you imagine a city without homelessness? I know I do. Uh, the toughest issue that cities deals with is, is the issue of homelessness. You know, you look at uh, Portland and Seattle and, uh, and uh, San Francisco, and you, it, it, there are tens of thousands of homeless folks, and they're overwhelmed. They don't even really know uh, where to start. But you know, in Boise, uh, it's a manageable issue. One homeless person is one too many. You know, but in Boise, uh, we do a count every year uh, according to federal government guidelines. And we have around 120 chronically homeless people uh, in the city of Boise. Isn't that a number that we can go to work on? Won't you help us with this? You know, and we are uh, making a real difference. Uh, just in a month, we're going to dedicate New Path, the first permanent supportive housing development in the state of Idaho. And it's a really good looking development. I don't even think this is a development looks better on the ground than it does in the renderings. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, a development that anybody would be happy to move into. It's right on Main Street in downtown Boise. 40 units for chronically homeless people. A safe place to live and the services to help them out. But right behind it is a project for homeless veterans. You know, one homeless person is too many. Uh, bless your hearts. One homeless person is too many, but homeless veterans simply unacceptable. They've done so much for us. Uh, we need to get them a home. And the IHFA has gone out with a project. The deadline was a few weeks ago, and I believe the only project is a project based in Boise where the city is working with a private developer for 27 units uh, of housing for homeless veterans, and the VA would provide the services to help them. Uh, we've got a little ways to go, but we believe we can do that and help our veterans out. You know, together that would be 67 units uh, for the chronically homeless, better than half the problem that's out there. Can't we then go to work on the other half and work? These are the chronically homeless people. If we can have success there, we can move on to those that are permanently homeless uh, and make a dent there as well. If give us the momentum, uh, we need your help to dig in and, and make that happen. You know, uh, we have had community conversations uh, all this summer about the issues of growth. Hundreds of people have turned out. It's been so important to listen to you. What are your concerns? What are your priorities? And in every one of those sessions, what comes to the forefront is affordable housing. Uh, and understandably, uh, you know, over uh, the next 20 years, conservatively, maybe too conservatively, but you know, we expect to see around 50,000 new residents. And those 50,000 residents are going to need around 20,000 units of housing or about 1,000 a year. You know, so how are we going to deal with that? Uh, what are our uh, processes and what are our programs uh, to handle that? I want to talk today and grow our housing about five of those, five initiatives that we, if we act now, we can make a real difference. And the first is if the state ain't going to do it and we still got to push him to do it, let's have our, whole, our own housing trust. Can't we do one here? Can't we take public money and philanthropic money and maybe get to a number like 20 million, 20 million to help uh, affordable housing and a way to perpetuate and roll that forward? I think that's an achievable number and we can do that and we need to do that. You know, secondly, we need to see other incentives we can give to developers to get them to build more of the development we want to see. Uh, uh, housing that's 80% of, uh, of the median income. Uh, we've had success with providing incentives. Downtown housing has come around with that. We need to bring that to the city as a whole. 
You know, we've worked our property so hard. Adair Manor is a great example. We're always looking, does the city have property that we can lend to a project? But there's all kinds of property out there owned by individuals and businesses and nonprofits and trusts. Can't some of that property be anted in and make it a mixed use, mixed income development all around town? I think we can do that. You know what we need too, ladies and gentlemen, is supply. This is such a great council. They work the zoning issues so hard, but we need to maximize the densities that we can have. Uh, you know, if, if you don't have supply, the demand is gonna come. We have to have more supply and make the most of what we can do in existing uh, city limits and in the area of impact uh, to make a real dent in that. And finally, our Urban Renewal Agency, CCDC, and the IHFA, uh, they have the tools, some of the tools that we need. Uh, we need to take those tools and use them in different ways in new parts of the city. And that's how we need to move now and make a dent in this and keep Boise an affordable place to live. Is there anything more basic than a home and that's what we need to do and what we can do right now. You know, but those homes, that development, thank you very much. But you know, those homes, that development, they need to go where our comprehensive plan says they should go. Uh, next to uh, transit corridors and where there are a mix of uses but we cannot build in areas of the city that are too precious to us to build. And it brings me to the third challenge that I wanna talk about. How do we protect the environment we live in? You know, we are so blessed. This is one of the prettiest urban areas in the country. We have one of the cleanest rivers running through a city with 26 miles of Greenbelt. We have one of the cleanest rivers uh, in the country. Everybody should be so proud of our community that we made that happen. But you know, when you imagine the city of 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, don't you see the foothills as they are? You know, twice in 2001 and 2015. You showed what the, what the foothills mean to you. You voted to tax yourself in both of those years to protect those foothills. You know, they're priceless to you. Uh, and you know, we understand that in the city of Boise. You know, uh, 25, 30 years ago, the city uh, brought together all the various interests and got to work on a foothills plan, the Boise Foothills Plan. And it was uh, a plan that said, this, these are the areas where growth should go, where development should go, and these are the areas where it should not. And you know, they foresaw, it was, took four or five years, all kinds of tough trade-offs, a whole ton of work uh, went into that. But it has been what's guided us in the intervening decades uh, in our foothills. But it foresaw, and now we're coming to the logical conclusion of the plan. What I mean by that is those areas that were designated for development are, are either developed or, uh, or they're filling up. You know, we're not sure exactly how many units that is, but our best guess is around 400 units. You know, I say we shouldn't annex property or rezone property after that 400 units, I think collectively we need to say no more. You know, the foothills, ladies and gentlemen, are just too precious. Uh, we, when, when we look our children and we imagine their children and the generations to come, don't you want to be able to say that we protected that resource, that we protected the beautiful environment that we live in? I want to be able to say that, and I think you do too. And that's where, uh, where I want to take this. So what's the alternative? We have to build in the areas that we have. We have to build in the flatland. We have to do a mix of uses. Every neighborhood has to take their share of growth if we're going to protect the areas like the foothills that we need to. You know, and that same sensibility ought to guide us in how uh, we use energy. You know, like most cities, uh, Boise, uh, we rely on natural gas and electricity largely for our energy needs. But you know, increasingly, businesses are telling us, uh, I meet with them all the time, they say, you know, we want clean energy, we want renewable energy. Our customers are demanding it, and the prices are coming down. That's, you know, if we're going to separate ourselves, if we're going to be a city of imagination 
a city that plans for the future, uh, we have some clean, renewable energy, uh, but we need to do better, and Boise has to lead. We have to step out front uh, and set an example. That's why uh, I'm so pleased uh, to say today that we intend to. Uh, tonight, today I'm saying uh, that we are going to be, our city operations and our own facilities, those of the city government, will be exclusively uh, fueled by renewable clean energy by the year 2030. You know, that isn't a slogan, ladies and gentlemen. It's our commitment, but it's part of a bigger picture. We've already begun conversations with energy experts in our local util utilities. What should be the goal of the broader community? Uh, we need to get our heads together, have a whole community conversation and say, who are we? What do we want to be? What's our vision for the future? Uh, what is the city of imagination going to come up with here? We're going to have those conversations over the next several months, uh, and we're going to set those goals. And I hope by the next uh, state of the city, we can talk about that. Uh, it's just so important uh, for our future. You know, uh, transportation, housing, uh, our environment, energy, those are the challenges that we face. But truly, if we are a city of imagination, we can take those on. And those are important policy decisions that we need to make. They are vital to the future, but even more important is how we treat each other. I want to return to kindness and wonder. Remember those books with the notes in them? You know, isn't that a good metaphor? Isn't really Boise that book? And were the notes inside? Aren't we the agents of kindness and wonder? You know, uh, recently we lived through one of the toughest events, certainly that I've seen uh, in my lifetime, the stabbings of a few months ago. You know, our hearts go out to those children and their parents. Uh, but you know, I don't think I've ever been prouder than this community, than this city, the outpouring of love and resources and help for those folks. I was overwhelmed by the thousands of people that came to City Hall Plaza and spilled out uh, and took over Capitol Boulevard as a show of unity uh, to recommit ourselves that we are a city, a welcoming city, a city where everyone is welcome, no matter, no matter where you're from. It showed us that, that that sentiment, that unity is alive and well in the city of Boise. Yes, yes. You know, it's the biggest honor of my life to be the mayor of my hometown. And I know how much you love Boise. You know, in fact, over the last several months, uh, many people have come forward, have sought me out and have said, Mayor, I want to be part of an effort to make sh sure that we define and protect the values that make this such a great place to live. It's really pretty stunning to have seen that. It's something that uh, we've been thinking about a lot but several individuals came forward. You know, how are we going to keep uh, that rally uh, around uh, in, in the face of such a tragic event? How are we going to make sure that we continue to do that in the future? How are we going to make sure that the civility that we've known uh, for so many years and are known for, uh, that small town civility, how are we going to keep that even as we get bigger? You know, I think they're right, folks. I think we need to do that. We need to call out the values that make us Boiseans. You know, call it Boise Kind, our kindness manifesto. Uh, we'll use the best name, but I'm going to enlist those folks that came forward and all of you. It ought to be concise. It needs to be to the point. Uh, but we need to call those values out now. It'll say to those coming to Boise, you're welcome, please, you know, come here. But the, these are our expectations of you. And it says to each other, these are our expectations of each other. You know, things like waving and saying hello to people you don't even know. That's, our, that's what people love about Boise, folks. You know, I've talked about this. I bet it's happened a dozen times just in the last few days. I'll let somebody in. 
and they'll give me the wave. Or they'll let me in, that give and take of the wave. After you've let somebody into traffic, that's a city where you want to live in. That's so important. You know, knowing your neighbors and helping them out when they need help. Uh, we need to do that, folks. We need to identify it. Again, it needs to be short, but we need to do it now, and we need to push it out. And these are our expectations of each other. Uh, great. Help me out with that. Because uh, you know who said this best? You know who got this right? Uh, Mr. Rogers. Uh, you know, Mr. Rogers, if he isn't the patron saint of cities, he's certain the pa certainly the patron saint of neighborhoods. Uh, you know, he said a lot of profound things. Uh, but he said something that he got so right. He said, you know, we live in a world where we need to share responsibility. It's so easy to say, that's not my child. It's not my community. Uh, it's not my world. It's not my problem. But then there are those that see a need and respond. Those people are my heroes. You need to be those heroes, ladies and gentlemen. We all need to be. Be the woman at the fair that helps the little kid out. Be those messages in the books. Spread that spirit across our city. We can do that and do it now. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we really, truly will be the most livable city in the country. Thank you all so very much for being here this year. Thank you.